All right, guys, such a comic again today. Hope you're doing well and enjoying your day so far. Big questions have been raised after Ultra got slapped around again by Optic Texas in the grand finals of their home major in Toronto as to exactly why, according to Prez, they keep seeming to collapse in these grand finals. Yes, they've won a couple of finals over the last two years, but in the last two seasons, even going back to the last four seasons, there have been notable occasions where this Toronto team completely disappears when it comes to a grand finals. What's going on with these guys? What needs to change? Very much intrigued to your thoughts in the comments below. Hit the like button if you enjoy subscribe if you're new as always I would greatly appreciate it first of all I thought this is really interesting the Kenny career cars a player that you know we talked about being underrated as far as I'm concerned a player that is in the conversation to becoming even a top 10 player of all time over the next season or so if he wins champs this year he's absolutely on the borderline of being a top 10 player of all time because you know the teams that he's won with over so many years so many different titles and um, like series win loss 15 finals appearances 9 tournaments wins now of course he's won the world championship as well so yeah stellar card for Kenny of course you know these numbers also don't tell the entire picture and the entire story of how impactful Kenny is to teams we know that when he was on Thieves certainly in the latter half of his time on the Thieves when Octane became this really well-rounded player that could slay and could communicate and was doing the right things inside and outside of the game it feels to me that Kenny picked up on a lot of that right and you know he was even competing back in advanced warfare people kind of maybe forget this a little bit than when he was 15 years of age or whatever, along with Envoy, they were playing back in Advanced Warfare pre the age restriction coming into play, right? Then when World War II came around, Kenny can actually come in for his rookie season and was, you know, one of the best players. Well, he was the best player in the game, I would say, over the course of that year. Certainly with the SMG in hand, Gunless was the best kind of flex, I would say. It was between Gunless and Kenny that year for the MVP awards. But Kenny, I think, won it relatively unanimously and, of course, was also Rookie of the Year as well. But he was in the scene a couple of years before in Advanced Warfare. The age restriction comes in for Black Ops 3 with the CWL. Then he can't play for a little while. Goes to Halo briefly. Then, of course, makes the return. And, well, the rest is history since then. Quickly to mention as well, Kenny does not appear on this list quite. But I suppose he's not too far away. This is Slayer rating. Because we put some fixes together on the website here on the advanced stats pages. Where you can filter by LAN and stuff like this. So, yeah, filtering by offline as in LAN events, you find the following in terms of Slayer rating. This effectively equates to if a series goes the distance, so if it goes to a game 5, effectively a round 11 as well, how many kills would be expected from a player in that series, right? Because, you know, if you're 3-0-ing everyone and you're dropping 57 kills, you know, what does that really mean? But if you extrapolate a series to a game 5, like going all the way down to the wire, how many kills are expected in that scenario, this is what you'll find. And it is pretty well aligned in general with, you know, the MVP of the season. Now, Asim is actually up in fourth here, which to me is pretty surprising. I did not realise he had these numbers, or maybe there's some sort of error here, because... I don't know, did Asim have a 1.2 and a half point this year? Seems kind of unlikely to me, but whatever. This is how it looks. I'm pretty sure most of these are right anyway, if that is wrong, but maybe it's not wrong. Don't know. Hydra is leading the line by a while. 93. So in a five-map series, he's averaging 93 kills, basically, which is ridiculous. Scrappy's at 90. Simps at 87. Illy was at 84. Then you've got Pred, Ghosty, Standy, 04, and Shotzi running out the top 10. But yeah, Hydra's quite a way ahead, which is maybe not a surprise, but like the extent of of that is maybe somewhat impressive. Another big one here, thanks to TJ Halley's dab pen. So we put together the strength of schedule for the major four qualifiers based on the current standings, right? So these are the games that are played by all the 12 teams. This is where they currently sit in the league right now and, well, how hard their games actually end up being. So Toronto, their average opponent is sixth, effectively, 5.57. So the hardest strength of schedule is Toronto this stage, technically. They play Sir to a sixth, Vegas to a tenth there easiest game, Miami, Thieves, Minnesota, Optic Texas, and FaZe. So that is a pretty hard run for Toronto. Not like it's massively going to matter, but, um, you know, that's how it looks. Now, let's just have a look at Optic, for example. They have a pretty easy run. Miami, Vegas, Minnesota, Ravens, Subliners, Boston, Toronto. So their hardest game is Toronto, theoretically, and Surge have the easiest run where they play Toronto first, and after that, it gets quite considerably easier, including, of course, the Subliners in here as well. So 
So, you know, it's not, um, you know, an absolute walk in the park. I mean, none of these teams are. And of course, right now, a team like Vegas might not look that good. They're the 10th seed. But who knows how good they'll be in, you know, a couple of weeks' time when they're playing Seattle. Could be a different story. So you never fully know. But um, this is kind of the strength of schedule. So Boston, just looking at some of the teams that need points, right? Because Boston needs to win you know, five, six of these games. It ain't happening, obviously. But nonetheless, their run isn't great because they play phase and optics. You can chalk those two up. You might as well just try and win the other ones. So it's pretty interesting how Seattle Surge, they're at 130 points and they have a very easy run, relatively. Whereas Miami Heretics, they have 130 points, but they have a hard run. So like they play Optic, Toronto and phase, all of those three in their set of matches here. So you know, I still think Miami will make the World Championship, but those games are going to be far from easy. Ravens as well, they have a pretty hard run, so they're at 120 only. They play FaZe and Optic here and the Subliners. So um, if you ever play three of the top four, that's going to be a pretty hard rate. That, of course, is the benefit by being a top four team is that you can't play yourself. So, you know, theoretically, your games should end up being substantially easier, which is generally why we'll see, you know, Optic and FaZe, for example, down here because they can't play themselves, so their games become somewhat more straightforward. But I wanted to share a couple of clips here. Pred was asking some funny questions to Real, basically talking about how when they played Miami at the Major, it was uh, not going in the favour of Real. Now, to be fair, I don't know if Pred has quite the same um, you know, vitriol in some ways towards Real as he does towards the rest of the guys. We know that, of course, it was Vickel who threw up the 3-0 sign, and then ever since then, Pred's been, you know, he took it personally, right? And ever since they've played Miami since then, he's been trying to 3-0 slam him every time. Sometimes it's been a 3-0, sometimes it's been a 3-1, but every time it's been comfortable for Optic. Real came in slightly later, so um, you know, I'm sure this is just a, a nice, friendly bit of banter between both of them, but entertaining nonetheless. And of course, Pred's feeling all sorts of confidence after the major event victory. However, there was also comments made by Pred on the Toronto situation. What they were talking about here, now I'm not so familiar with the law on this. Kenny knows the law a lot better than I do on the whole League of Legends saga, but he was talking about this G2 team of a few years ago, how they got to the finals, and they collapsed to Fun Plus Phoenix. And if you listen closely, as we go through the clip, they talk about the collapse in the finals and Prez's art. They did the Toronto special, right? They absolutely got slapped around in another finals. What the fuck? Oh, so, oh yeah, serious question there, Real. Um, yeah. On that sub base, map one against you guys. Why, why, didn't, you, why didn't you guys fucking kill me? <laughs> I don't know, bro. <laughs> too good, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, I'm actually fucking dying. Holy fuck, I'm balls. What, man? Your skin's pissing me off, bro. I'm not gonna lie. I'm restarting my game one sec. Yeah, Loki, I get extra aimers on your skin. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so G2 gets the grand final. They were godlike. Oh my god. And, like, they get the grand finals. And this team that's in the, the other team, this is like, uh, they're called FPX, like yeah. Funplex Phoenix. Yeah. And, like, this year, League made a song. Just for the yeah, it made a song called like Phoenix Fly Phoenix something Phoenix yeah, and like it was just like the script was rolling because like because oh. like because like this team FPX was like in the play-ins they were like they were not supposed to be here no no what all. yeah they like made a Bro, crazy they run slam G two and G two was like the best team like everybody thought so G that's the first time a European people have ever been on yeah. the final what the fuck well they made it to back to back finals G two yeah but then and they, they got won? slammed both times they got slammed no, yeah they that got was some ultra well. shit damn some ultra <laughs> shit. So a team that came in from playing one? Yes, bro. Nobody thought they were playing to win a tournament like this would be. That's like that's like yeah. insane. Or no. But that's it's like, like their 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 name their team name was uh, Funplex Phoenix and the song and name is Phoenix. Five, yeah, nah, that's no, that, that actually is bro. fucking insane. Was, that's actually that's like scripted almost. It was Everyone too scripted. probably said G two was gonna win, right? Look at that stadium. Oh yeah, because G two beat all the good like beat most of the good teams, and they were like they actually got like got like players and like at the time. FPX, like, they have good players, granted, but they were not good. They this were is not insane, a good team. Bro. Dude, That's Faker? Crazy. Imagine COD could do shit like this. Faker. So we saw the Opta guys the other day talk about the vetoes, right? Saying that we're not really sure what Ultra were doing here, playing into our hands. Giving us sub-base game one, giving us, you know, an invasion search, been very good. Rio Hardpoint that they like. And I think they even they said as well that, you know, they could have 7-0'd this series. Like, they like a Karachi search. I know that it's also a good map for Ultra, but, you know, obviously like Karachi search. They love Karachi control. Rio search, I guess they were confident on as well. So interesting to me that Ultra like had the advantage, right? Because they have the winners bracket, not really much of an advantage, but they've got the winners bracket advantage where they can choose some of the maps. At least they can choose which control goes. 
they get um, you know they get to choose what team they want. They get to pick effectively maps and size and these other things. But lots of their decisions played into Optic's hand. Okay, that was a pre-game mistake maybe by Ultra. That's certainly how Optic see it. But also there's an argument that you know they just kind of roll over and die. And we've seen this before with this Ultra team. Even when it wasn't quite the same team, this is when they lost the World Championship Grand Finals last year, of course, to the New York Subliners. They got completely crushed. Kisman and Skies put up absolutely generational 1.5 plus performances. Obviously, Scrappy had a hard time in the series. Everyone just got slammed. And, you know, this was like, wow, Champs Grand Finals getting beaten 5-0. Difficult to live this one down, right, for Scrappy. Even to this day, that is true. And then got beat 4-0 in Grand Finals. And then got beat 4-0 in the Grand Finals just the other day. Now, to be fair, in that series against Optic, Scrappy still played well. It was the rest of the team. But also, it reminded many of the events in Car War. This was the Sage 5 major back in Car War when Ultra famously went up 4-0. Very different team back here. Of course, Scrappy was not in the picture at this point. But um, still, a couple of the players you may recognize. This was the Bantz Kami Insight Kleenex team that went up 4-0 in the Grand Finals and then got reverse swept by the Minnesota Rocker to end up losing 5-4 to four in, you know, certainly in the CDL era, the biggest finals collapse you're ever going to see. So it's not like Ultra cannot win. They have won. It's not like they have this kind of, you know, thing that FaZe seem to have where they get to a Sunday and they can't quite perform at the same level that they've been at up until that point in the season, which is, you know, a question, of course, for another day. And Ultra won the first event of the season very impressively. They won an event last season as well in Optics home grounds. You know, they won an event before that. Like, it's not like Kleenex and Insight and Scrappy and Envoy aren't winners. You know, we've got World Champion in here in Envoy and Kleenex and Insight have won, you know, five events, four events in their career respectively. But is there some sort of common denominator here in terms of when the series starts off relatively poorly or when the momentum seems to go the other way? Do Kleenex and Insights, you know, have what it takes to execute in that scenario? I don't know. Like, I obviously, as a European COD fan, it's kind of difficult to admit, but there might be, you know, back in the day, it always used to be a talking point about how the European players were just always choking the key moments. And I don't really think that was, I think that was overblown. But uh, I don't know, maybe there's still some truth to it in the sense that when things are going badly, you know, these guys do not seem to be able to quite lock in again in the way that they might want to. I'm not really sure there was any stopping that Optic train in the finals, but I do think that if it had been FaZe in the finals, for example, it would not have been a 4-0. That is my feeling. Like, FaZe never go down like that. Like, even if they're not playing the best, and obviously their Sunday record is not great at all, but they always will put up a competitive fight. They'll win maps off you and stuff like that. And obviously that was not the case here for Toronto. So, you know, Pred's putting the dagger in to some extent. I'm imagining they're probably going to find a way to turn it around. But at this point, Toronto's record in these scenarios feels like slightly more than just a coincidence, right? But very much on Twitter, your thoughts in the comments below. Just one final thing to mention, if Clayster qualifies for champs, which, well, hopefully he will, he's in position, he's on the borderline of making it work, he will tie Scump and Krim with 10 champs appearances. But it's been quite some time since Clay's even been to a world championship. He didn't make it last year, wasn't there the year before, of course, after the subliners drama. So, um, and of course, these his records over the seasons so hopefully he can make it back but it's kind of crazy to think about that it's been since cold war that clay's even been at the world championship but hit the like button if you enjoyed subscribe if you're new take care and i'll see you next time damn this guy pat didn't hook you up no 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 hookup we pay him for the flank and now i'm giving him more money like wait you guys pay pat for everybody. the flank yeah we get to pay per episode yo i'll, I'll come on the show what you guys need so I, I, I could be pat, i could be way roll? more uh, you know, controversial rogue? than a i'm down Shotzi, dog, brother, that's the only chip he'll win this year. Maybe for the next what about, decade. What about, what about LA Thieves? Would he roast your own team? Oh, LA Thieves, you guys are f***ing lost, brother. You put me on stage, I'm winning more rounds of S&D than they are. I'm over here, they're losing to fucking Vickle, bro. We were slamming him in ranked. Miami Heretics? Nah. Not Wait, looking good for LA Thieves coaches, right bro. now. Let's start cooking coaches. Cap and Shane, I don't know what the fuck those guys are doing. Nah, I can't cook Cap and Shane, bro. Nah, can't do that. No, I only can. cook the players, bro, because it's certainly their fault. I can I can always cut Cap and Shane. Cap turns the ball over thirteen times a FIFA game. Like he needs Damn. to get a grip. He's got he he's got no discipline, bro. No ball protection. So many TOs, bro.